In part one of this series, I explored the origin of the Inquisition. I stated that corruption in the medieval church resulted in the birth of dissident religious movements that either wanted to reform the medieval church or wanted to withdraw from the medieval church on the grounds that the church had deviated from the pure faith and had become apostate. I also stated that the Inquisition was launched to annihilate those dissenting religious movements. The Bogomils, the Cathars, and the Waldenses were three of the dissenting groups that attracted the attention of the medieval Inquisition. In this presentation, I will go one step further and show how the Inquisition went about its work of imprisoning, punishing, and annihilating heretical Christians, dissidents, women, Jews, homosexuals, for citizens of the New World, enslaved Africans, and Muslims as well. Now let me begin by correcting something I said in the last presentation. I mentioned the fact that the Inquisition ended on July 15, 1834 in Europe. That there represented the abolition of the Spanish Inquisition. The Roman Inquisition, however, persisted until 1859. I should also like to add that while the term Holy Office of the Inquisition is no longer used, the Congregation for the Doctrines of Faith still continues its role of preserving and protecting the Catholic faith. In 1979, the Jewish historian Carlo Ginzburg wrote a letter to Pope John Paul II petitioning the Pope to open the Inquisition archives to scholars. Ginsburg had first-hand experience of hatred and persecution. His father, Leon Ginsburg, was an anti-fascist agitator who was beaten to death by the Nazis during the war. Carlo was forced to go into hiding with his non-Jewish grandmother. Twenty years passed before Ginsburg received a reply from Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrines of Faith, inviting him to the opening of the archives. The opening of the archives allowed scholars limited access to look at documents reaching up to the year 1903. In uh, making the announcement, Cardinal Ratzinger said, We know all the sins of the church, and I hope more will not be added to them. Two years after the opening of the archives in uh, 1998, Pope John Paul II, in the year 2000, led a penitential procession through the streets of Rome to apologize for errors and misdeeds of the past, including prominently the Inquisition. Let's shift our attention from the 20th century back to the 12th century when the Inquisition was launched. In 1184, faced with the spread of the dissident Qatar movement, Pope Lucius condemned all heretics and their supporters at a synod in Verona. Individuals had often challenged the church, but the Qatars were the first mass movement organization to openly challenge the ecclesiastical control of the church in Europe. Now, notwithstanding the steps taken by Pope Lucius to condemn heretics and their supporters, it was Pope Innocent III who was credited for launching the crusade against the Cathars. Now, there were some very subtle differences between the medieval Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, and the Roman Inquisition. But there were also features that were common to all of them. 
The inquisitorial process started with the arrival of the inquisitor in a town or village. Inquisitors were specially appointed ecclesiastical judges, usually chosen from the Dominican or Franciscan order or other ecclesiastical backgrounds. Inquisitors were invested with white powers to investigate, judge, and prosecute anyone under their jurisdiction. On arriving in a town, the Inquisition, the Inquisitor, would preach a sermon in which all would be asked to voluntarily come forward and confess any deviations from the faith that they had committed. A grace period or a heresy amnesty was extended to all. Those who came forward during this grace period or amnesty period could be expected to receive more lenient treatment and punishment. Individuals who took advantage of the grace period, however, discovered that in addition to confessing their deviations, it was expected that they would also inform on any known dissidents in their family or circle of friends or neighbors. The naming of names was therefore a central feature of the Inquisition at every interval. Now, once the grace period ended, the Inquisitor began his work in earnest. Anyone suspected or named by an informer as a heretic was apprehended and hauled before the Inquisitor's court. Detainees were interviewed using tactics that are still in use by law enforcement, intelligence agencies, and military tribunals today. Inquisitors utilize the good cop, bad cop routine alternating between severity and mercy. They use rapid-fire interrogation techniques, firing multiple questions at the accused, often not giving them sufficient time to answer. The objective of the Inquisitor was to elicit contradictory answers and furnish information for deeper questioning. Detainees might be told that they were just small fish and all they had to do was to confess and supply information on others who were the real targets. Inquisitors might even pretend that they had extensive dossiers on detainees and refer to these extensive notes from time to time to create the impression that the notes contain contradictory information from what the detainees were presenting. Inquisitors might also give uh, detainees the impression that it was in their best interest to confess immediately rather than face the possibility of indefinite imprisonment due to the fact that the Inquisitor would be leaving shortly and did not know when he would return. Now, these are many of the tactics that were outlined in Bernard Guy and Nicholas Emmerich's Manual for Inquisitors and they were all employed to secure confessions from detainees. Recalcitrant or stubborn detainees who refused to confess were then subject to enhanced interrogation or simply put, torture. Revisionist historians like Henry Kamen are convinced that modern research is forcing us to challenge the way in which we view the Inquisition. Cayman, for example, points out that over the span of 400 years, the Spanish Inquisition was responsible for the death of only about 3,000 people, to which I can only say that the issue is not how many people were killed by the Inquisition, but that the Inquisition killed people, period. But before we get to the auto de fe, or the act of faith as it was called in Orwellian double speak, let's talk a little bit more about enhanced interrogation during the Inquisition. In all fairness, we should uh, concede to the revisionists like Henry Kamen the point that torture was controlled and may have been milder than the torture of prisoners by secular authorities around the globe. There were rules surrounding how long a prisoner could be tortured and the number of times a prisoner could be tortured. 
A physician was also supposed to be present during the enhanced interrogation. Now, while torture could be used to get a confession, the confession had to be confirmed later by the detainee. Suspected heretics could be represented by someone trained in law, but who would have been so stupid to go into an inquisitor's court to defend a suspected heretic when aiding and abetting heretics was also a crime punishable in the, Inquis in the Inquisition courts? The different levels of torture employed were so effective at breaking the resolve of suspected heretics that there's a story of a Knights Templar who is supposed to have said that the torture placed him in a frame of mind in which he was prepared to confess that he had personally killed Jesus Christ himself. Ordeals by fire and water seem to have been standard forms of torture. Our contemporary practice of waterboarding is a continuation of the ordeal by water which simulated drowning in the suspected heretic. Inquisitors knew how to restrain suspected heretics in ways that could produce exquisite pain. There were also a number of devices used to give suspected heretics a preview of hell in the inquisitor's cell. Confession was not a simple matter of saying, yes, I am a heretic. Confessions had to be specific, which proved to be a pain in the well everywhere for suspected heretics who sometimes did not know what charges were brought against them. If the Inquisitor felt that the confession was simply a way to get out of the pain of torture, this would nullify the confession leading to more torture. Confessions also had to be accompanied by the naming of other heretics. Confessions without naming of heretics was also not acceptable. This practice no doubt created a climate for vindictive mischief. Denouncing one's enemies to the Inquisition was almost a perfect form of revenge. Confessions might save suspected heretics from being relaxed which was the Orwellian doublespeak for being burnt or crisp at the stake. But confessions did not mean that there would not be other forms of punishment inflicted. Other punishments included the wearing of special crosses on your clothing to indicate that you had been a victim of the Inquisition. Uh, other people were forced to do pilgrimages, which presented a lot of financial challenges both to the individual and their families. Uh, some uh, of the detainees were forced to go to fight in the crusades. Others were sentenced to periods of imprisonment and then others were subject or sentenced to being rowers in the galleys of the ships. This brings us to the event known as the auto de fe in the inquisition the auto de fe or the act of faith as it was euphemistically referred to was the ultimate punishment dished out by the court of the inquisition inquisitors use john chapter 15 and verse 6 as justification for the auto de fe this text says if a man abide not in me, he scats forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. This was the biblical verse that uh, the church used as justification to burn heretics. The impenitent were dressed in special clothing to show who had confessed and who were to be relaxed. Those to be relaxed or burnt to a crisp at the stake were made to wear conical dunce hats, signifying that they had been delivered over to the secular authorities to be punished. Sometimes there was a macabre element included in the auto de fe. The remains of dead heretics who had escaped punishment during their lifetime were dug up and burned alongside living heretics. Living heretics who may have escaped the clutches of the Inquisition 
were burned in effigy and their property was seized. Needless to say, the Inquisition profited handsomely by seizing the property of all convicted heretics. In conclusion, the, Inquis the Inquisition was no show, song, and dance as employed in the Mel Brooks' hilarious comedy History of the World Part 1. Rather than being a comic show, the choreography of the Inquisition climaxing with the auto de fe was a dramatization of the final day of judgment when all humanity would stand before the great grand inquisitor Yahweh himself. Those who confess would be treated leniently where the impenitent would be cast into the fires of hell where they would be tormented for all eternity. The screams of heretics burning in the auto de fe was but a foretaste of the weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth that would take place in the final judgment. Inquisitors were therefore confident that they were doing God's work by showing people what their future destiny would be if they deviated from the true faith and succumb to heresy. I am Lenrod and Zulu Baraka, reminding us that learning history is easy. Learning the lessons from history, however, is very hard. Don't forget to like, to subscribe, and share this video with your friends and contacts in the Caribbean, the wider African diaspora, and on the continent of Africa. Asante Sane Stanana Kwahiri, which is Kish Swahili for, thank you very much, and goodbye.